Hello people, my name is Mohini Day and you're watching my brand new talk show, What Amelifa Wants. Now, I believe through the gifts we have in us, we give soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. Music to me is an explosive expression of humanity. It's something we are all touched by no matter what culture we are from. Today we're going to talk about how music can, without words, evoke our laughter, our fears, and our highest aspirations. I have someone really special with me today on my show. He's an American bass player known for, known for his work with numerous artists such as Joe Satriani, Frank Gambale, Steve Y, Vince Neil, Michael Skenker, and many more. He's one of my biggest idols and inspirations, someone I have worked with and I adore. Please welcome the incredible Stuart Ham. Hey, what's up, mom? <laughs> we missed that, right? We missed that. <laughs> How are you, first of all, and how are you coping up with this pandemic situation that we're in? Man, I'm doing great, you know. Uh, I am very positive today. It's a good day. It's wonderful to see you. It's and, wonderful to see you, too. Yeah, man. So, you know, it's cool. It's, it's strange that you know, in our life as, as musicians, I'm sort of used to being, I'll probably sure it's the same for you, being incredibly busy. Right, like you're on the road and you got to wake up after no sleep and go and yeah. go and go and go home, and I'm okay for t for a couple of weeks of like doing nothing, right. you know. And but then again, I'm used to that being broken up by getting on a plane and getting paid to fly to some exotic place to play my own music and having people applaud. Right, me. right. And I like that. That makes the summer yeah. okay. So this right. this this little isolation has lasted a little longer than we would all like, but uh, I know, yeah. I, I it's it. nice, no? It's nice, no? Like after all the work and after all the hard work that we do, and always traveling, finally this little time to ourselves. But it's like, like you said, it's been too long now. <laughs> I wish it was a little shorter. <laughs> I, I, I found that like six weeks is about the limit if you can do anything. I did when I was like eighteen. I did a cruise ship where we played like you know show sets, and man, you, you can sort of make it through any bad situation for six weeks, and beyond that. You know, it, it, it gets to you a bit Yeah, much. I know, it's depressing. Well, let's hope to see some light. I got, oh, I got a little bit of light. I got to say that I did, um, uh, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel, which I guess I can announce it now. But, you know, I think maybe the last time I saw you, you sat in with my band at Big Potato. Right. Right? I, no, maybe I saw you at the NAMM show after that. But... Rumor has it that they are starting to do uh, live streams from the baked potato. Oh wow! And hey. it looks like it looks like I may be doing a gig at the baked potato on a week from Saturday on May thirtieth. Wow, that's incredible! That's amazing that they're doing this. Well, it is. Well, they. I mean, they. You know, they got to stay in business too. But it's easy if there's no crowd. You get three people. It's with a guitar player played with many times. One of my best friends and drummers and you know we get on stage we're, we're we're far apart and they have cameras set up and uh people can buy subscriptions but i man you know i've been practicing but it's not the same as grooving with the drummer or or playing with people you know what or I'm saying? You, yeah or even just having like the audience watching us it's so beautiful we well, miss we're still that. gonna miss that you know yeah but. we're sure gonna miss that yeah <laughs> well we can always do what i just did just like get a app for it and just Hit the applause button. <laughs> <laughs> I get that from you. I need that. I need that when I wake up, that's what I need. <laughs> oh God, cool. Okay, so my first question to you is: What is music to you? And like I was saying in the start, how do you think it makes an impact on our life? How does it evoke our emotions, our fears, our aspirations? You know, I mean, music is certainly the uh, the most important thing in my life. I come from a whole family of. You know, musicians, my father was a very well-known uh, music educator and uh, wrote a number of books on the history of popular music in America and was an ethnomusicologist. And my uh, mother was an opera singer. And uh, I have oh, an older wow. brother who, you know, know plays Calcutta now, plays Sarod. But he always was listening to, like, Miles Davis and Cream and, and Sun Ra and all this strange music. But... So when I'm, my, my father sort of taught, taught the first academic courses on popular music. So, and he was friends with John Cage, the, the avant-garde composer. So right. I take my little plastic army man and put him in the, between the strings of his piano for him to play his prepared piano. So your father was a piano player? Well, he was a composer. 
He was a composer. You know, John okay. Cage wrote these pieces for prepared piano, which is where he put like like uh, golf tees and stuff in the strings of the piano to make it much more percussive. Mm -hmm. But point being, I was exposed to like avant-garde music. I was in operas. I was in jazz band. I was playing classical music. I was playing upright bass in a swing band. And all all forms of music from classical to pop to jazz were treated with the same respect. You know? Right. But and, how, uh, out of all the instruments, did you uh, pick up bass? How did well, that happen? You know, uh, there's about three stories. One is there's a really stupid TV show when I was growing up called The Partridge Family about this okay. family that played bass together. And the, the bass player in the band was sort of a geeky, pudgy, 13-year-old geek. Danny Bonaducci kind of looked like me, and he played bass. <laughs> really? And, uh, I would like to see it. And uh, well, well, one day they had a, I lived in a little town in the Midwest. <laughs> And uh, uh, a rock band set up on the on the tennis court. So I got on my bicycle and I rode over to see what the noise was. And the bass player had a green P, uh, jazz bass with a matching green headstock okay. with a white curly barbecue cord into one of those uh, uh, custom amps with the Naga hide padding and the chrome portholes. And I was like, that is so cool. <laughs> and then uh, so I got my first bass for Christmas in 1973 and really learned how to play playing upright bass and in, in, right. you know, chord charts. And then I heard the song Roundabout on the radio when I was like 12 right. and rode to Kmart and bought the album uh, Fragile by Yes. And I saw Chris Squire with his curly hair and his cape and his Rickenbacker. And I'm like, that is the coolest thing in the world. I got to be a bass player. <laughs> okay, so that's how it happened. That's it. Wow. Did you ever think about playing any other instrument after you picked up the bass? I had... Uh, you know, I played piano for years, and I had aspirations of being a, a pianist. And I mean, most of the music I listen to is, is piano. Um, so, um, but you know, I got a lot of encouragement early on playing bass, and I just as soon as I started playing, I was good at it. You know, and I felt comfortable. How and old I just, were you then when you picked up the bass? When you started like actually learning the bass? I, I got my first bass for Christmas in 1973. I think <laughs> a few years before you were born. And, uh, <laughs> No, I, I just remember I got, we, uh, you know, in, in the Illinois, like it was really competitive. They call it stage band. And even in my junior high, they had the A and the B band and we'd have state competitions. And I was always named to the all state, you know, winner jazz band. But when I was in junior high school, we went and we played. And after I got done, a, a band leader from another school came up to me and he said, hey, young man, you really got something special, you know, keep at it. You know, when you're that young and someone gives you encouragement, you know, it just, it means, it means the world. Yeah, it so it, it just fit right in, and I love, as you know, I mean, we like all the soloing and stuff, but, you know, I come from before, I played bass before all that happened, you right. know, and I love just, you know, walking bass line, because what you're doing is you're, you're, you, the bass unites the harmony and the melody, Absolutely. and you're really holding it all together and really directing traffic, like, if you want to change stuff, you can do it without anyone else knowing what's going on, really. Right. So now everybody wants to know this, like, when did you actually start working on these intricate details of your techniques that you play with, you know, uh, say tapping, phrasing, syncopation, the participation of the coast notes, you know, all these things, slapping. Well, you know, like I said, the, the, the electric bass is only like 70 years old, right? And, and it's hard to believe that, you know, I mean, people have been slapping and doing triplets on upright bass forever. You know, people claim I invented the triplet, but if you go back to like 30s, there's people doing triplets with ghost notes in this hand. They've been doing that forever, right? Right. So, but but in, in 19, like 1977, 78, when I was playing, you know, there was dudes that were really expanding the instrument. In, in rock, there was John Entwistle and Chris Squire that were that were playing fundamentally bass, but, but, but a little more trebly, you know, clear sound and playing more melodically, you know? Mm -hmm. And then my brother was had Weather Report records and there was Alfonso Johnson. And then, you know, bam, here comes Stanley Clark, Right, you know, hey, playing chords, and then Chris Squire did right. the song Fish, where there's harmonics. Like what? And then, yeah. uh, and then I moved to Boston in 1978, and I would go see Jeff Berlin play every night. And I'm like, wow. playing chords on a bass, what? And then, you know, February 8th, 1978, at the Orpheum Theater, I saw Weather Report with Jocko, and wow, that's rough. He was at the height. You know, I saw him a number of times. Wow. You know, and those died, but he was, you know. He just changed everyone's Lucky you, you got to see him live. Wow. I, I, I mean, I saw the Joni Mitchell tour twice, you know, with Pat wow. McBee and Lyle Mays. And yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible. I wish I was born then.
you know, but but I mean the whole the whole thing changed then, you know. I mean people and literally like like when I was in high school, like maybe maybe a dozen people slapped on the bass, you know. I mean right. you know, I, I I was living in Vermont and I saw I think Larry Graham playing with, with James Brown and I, I drove to the music store and I got a bass off the wall and I and I went Ow and the guy <laughs> the guy had me kicked out of the store thinking I was trying to break his bass, you know? <laughs> So, so it was, it was just in the air. People, especially known, and I never thought of the bass as a solo instrument. And I loved hearing like Glenn Gould play piano or Rostopovich play cello. But you know, bass was a fundamental instrument. No one had thought right. of like solo bass. And then you right. see Jocko and you know Chris Squire. used to do an iconic company bass solo. Um, and then, then I started you know working on on uh, pieces from my piano repertoire. And I've been playing with Steve Vai, and that's when. Um, you know, everyone was playing Eruption by Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, but you were like you were the only one who were actually who was actually doing all this tapping stuff. Like n the way you do tapping on your bass is very different. It's very unlike others, you know. So when well, it was when I, when I started to like again the like like in, in Eruption, you it's hammer-ons, but you realize that if you if you tap, you don't need two hands to play a note. One to fret it, one to pick it. If you just tap down on it, your other hand is free to do other things. Other things, yeah. So that allowed me to, um, you know, transcribe some of the piano pieces, like, you know, the Bach preludes. And, um, you know, I think the contrapuntal, me used to playing two things, you know, mm -hmm. and piano helped me do things like the Peanuts theme where I could play, you know, play. Did one you play the piano as well? Played piano for years and years and years and years. Ah, um, maybe that helped then. With it absolutely this. did. And the cool thing about the, um, you know, if you play piano, when you, it's hard to see harmony on bass, but if you're doing like box prelude and C, you start to see, well, that's just a C triad, the second chord, well, that's a D7 with the seventh in the bass. Yeah. So really able to visualize harmony on, you know, on the fretboard of a bass in a different way. And then I, I'd say at that point, the other guys, I mean, Billy was tapping and Stanley Jordan. Right. At a certain point where like, I don't want to, you know, you learn from stealing. I learned from stealing as much Chris Squire, you yeah. know, John Entwistle, Paul McCartney, Jeff Berlin. I could I could steal back when you had to take the needle off and slow the record down. Yeah. But I, I didn't want to be influenced and, and just came up in trying to learn these pieces. And, and I'd have to say that, right. you know, in solo bass, you're trying to tell a story. And I didn't learn to tap to play fast. It was so I could use more interesting vocabulary right. to tell a more interesting story. The magic is to be lyrical. To make music, right? Yeah. You know, if you, you know, again, if you see a, if you see someone playing bass and they they go, you know, if they stop playing that and go up here, the party's over. And if you can yeah. tell when someone's putting in a lick just to show off, if it doesn't serve the music, then yeah. it doesn't really have any point, right? Correct, correct. The correct balance of the chops that you have with your soul. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, it was it was such an exciting time. For bass, it was. I mean, you think about it. The, you know, now when someone, you know, when you come along or Victor or all the other generations, when a guy, by the time a bass player is fifteen or sixteen, to be able to play some chords, harmonics, tap, slap, yeah, all this, you know, play bebop heads, you know, mm. no one, no one did that, you know, yeah, years ago when I was playing. That's how much it's evolving, you know. Right. Absolutely. Now, uh, you, l l we all know you're always touring, like we spoke about earlier. You know, you're always touring, always on the road. How uh, do you find time to practice? If you do, I don't know if you still like practice, and you know, some people don't. You know, but if you do, how was your practice routine then when you were touring, and now how is it when you have all this time to yourself? You know, I, I have a. I mean, I could, I could teach whole courses on the physical aspect of playing bass, and no one does. I mean, if you're a football player, you don't just put on your shorts, your kit, and go out and play a game. And you warm <laughs> up, you stretch, you warm up for an hour, you cool down, you warm up, you go, then you go to play the game. And, and playing mm -hmm. bass, you know, especially if you're Steve Harris and have like a 40-pound bass, it's very physical. Yeah. So it's about, you know, if I had thought about, you know, breathing and, and stretching and meditation when I was younger, I wouldn't have quite so many sort of, you know, nagging, you know, bass player shoulder and carpal tunnel. Aches and all that, yeah. Right, right. So, but um, you train your body to do things. So I have a, a set routine uh, that I always go through before I play. And But I just love practicing, man. I love playing scales and, and learning new permutations. Right. 
playing skills. But do you think practicing. sometimes when you like, so are you like that kind of person who uh, likes to uh, practice and warm up until an hour before the show is about to start? Or yeah, I'm, I'm right before. I mean, I, I know that some people, like, I, I think sometimes, you know, Jeff Berlin gets a lot of flack for his opinions, but I think there are some people, like, he's a freak. He's so naturally talented, maybe, that he doesn't need to practice slapping or tapping. You know, yeah. but for me, you know, I, I sort of view it, and when I teach this, there, there's a certain physical coordination you got to mm -hmm. get past and master until you can right. create and play music, right? right? So for me, if I go through this routine and really work it slow and get the, the, the strength of my fingers and I'm playing on the fingertips, you know, it's happened like four times in my life, you know, then I really play well, you right. know? like that that makes me really happy when i control the instrument when it right. sounds good, when i feel i have control you know so but when you play too much before the show like when you're warming up too much again there is quantity and you know right. how much of it do you actually do all that matters but like uh do you think it, your stamina gets affected how what happens if you don't like warm up before the show and just go for the game does it i don't know man i mean it, 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 you know um I just think it's part of being human that if maybe there are situations where, you know, it's, you know, and all this is just some stupid pop, top 40 gig and I'm just playing, you know, uh, Roll with Thunder by ACDC. I don't need to warm up. And if I make a few mistakes, who cares? I can get by. It's not going to be in the mix anyway. Who cares? Man, if you ever take that attitude, yeah, then, then you might as well just get a job at the post office, right? Right. <laughs> really, yeah, get a day job. I, love yeah. it and I take it seriously and I, I want to do the best. I can, and, and of course I practice, I want to get better, you know, right. uh, but yeah, no, I have to physically warm up to get yeah. to the place where I'm, I'm comfortable, you know. So you have a couple of exercises that you do before uh, the gig is about to start, like to get your hands warmed up. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. a whole series, and depending how much time I have, how much, you know, how much time I get through it and stuff, and, oh. and they're evolving. I try to do permutations and play other keys, and you know, yeah. the, the, what I find is that you know, you, you can get into a uh, a rut where it's just, it's it's muscle memory, right? Like sometimes, like if I'm playing like like Moonlight Sonata, you know, which, which took, you know, six months just to work out the fingerings, right. another six months to, to get control of it where you can play with dynamics and phrasing. Right. But, you know, I can sort of play it faster. Mm. If I slow it down and I'm forced to think about what I'm playing, that's hard. Yeah. Right? And then, then it reveals the BS in your playing. Right, right, absolutely. And so I'll, I'll try to do it really slow. And then, you know, you build up such strength. And you also, you have to think about, well, you know, the sustain of the note. If I'm if I'm tapping, if I'm bending it sharp, I, I can more in tune of like, you know, harmonically what is, how it fits in the song. And mm -hmm. I just, I like being in control, you know. So I'm right. sorry, I play well, you know. Don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I used to practice a lot. And I was the same, like, I practiced like from morning until an hour before the show is about to start and then take that one hour to get ready and stuff. Um, and then I'd get up on stage and feel like a diva. I'll do my show and everything. But <laughs> what I realized is, what I realized is um, I would lose on my stamina because I, I would work too much before the show. I would work uh, just, yeah, it's too much. And then now uh, for the past, I would say two to three years, I have, I don't, I don't warm up before the show. I just like whatever in the sound check, a little bit, right. whittle, 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 that's all. And then after that, I don't even touch the bass and I'm absolutely fine. Like I don't have to flex, I don't have to warm up or anything. And that works the best for me. But it's well, I mean, I mean so, so the, the idea is at least for, you know, when we're playing, you know, the music I like now is like improvisational music, you know, like like going to California. These songs I've played a million times, they're templates. Right, right, but right. I, I don't, you know, shoot me if it's played the same way every night. I mm -hmm. want everyone to sort of play the same template, but to, but to listen to each other and make something happen. Right, right. right. And, and, and again, warm up doesn't mean like, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that uh, warm up is basically playing the songs. It's not playing the songs. It's just like getting all the, you know, just getting our fingers moving, like smooth I as hate, moving. I hate, I hate rehearsals. I know, I think, you know, no offense, but that's sort of like, the yeah. sort of big love between professionals and amateurs. It's like, hey man, I got a blues gig. Let's get together and rehearse. I'm yeah. like, let's not. <laughs> That's let's not. Tell me yeah. what it's in and let's try to you make do your own work. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, oh, but 
but yeah, I mean, yeah, the the idea is to is just to be prepared. And I I rarely practicing practice soloing. You know, I'll practice ideas, but man, I mean, that's like I want that to be in the the the, the spur of the moment. That's not really something I can rehearse. And it's such a different vibe between just sitting here practicing and then playing with people and listening and reacting in front of people. Yeah. So now that you said that, it's good because I was going to ask you how much of your playing in your gigs, especially solos, is completely improvised over chops and patterns that you've worked out before? And if it's both, then how do you keep that balance? Man, you know, co coming from a you know a, a, a classical background as well, you know, from from my father and my, and my mother and mm -hmm. studying classical music for a while. I mean, a, a lot of what I do is interpretation. You know, mm -hmm. where there is room for improvisation, but it's not like I'm Jeff Berlin and I can solo over giant steps for half an hour and and make it easy and 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 quote songs right. and, and solo over two fives with intelligence and wit. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's really interpretation, and and again, that's where you need the control. You know, if you can play with dynamics with different phrasing, you know, that's right. the challenge. It's like my brother playing ragas. You know, mm. you you would yes. think that it's really constricting because hey there's certain you can only play this scale going up and this scale yeah going up. yeah there's like a sequence you cannot go out of that yeah right but it's within that framework is where you find the art right so it's interpretation right. i mean i i put in a few sections where i'll put on a loop and i'll try to solo but again right. man i'm not you know soloing like you do man that's not really my thing you know <laughs> I'm, working, I'm working towards that sometimes i get off good one yeah <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. So what was your journey of finding your individuality, your style and this unique sound that you have? Uh, was that unconscious? It just happened or? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, again, I, I listened to a lot of piano music and I'd have to say my, my muse, my favorite musician is Glenn Gould, you know, who's a Canadian piano player. Right. From the right. And he had this way of wow. playing of, of moving his fingers straight down right and every note is so precise that when he plays four-part fugues you can hear every voice right so in a certain aspect that's sort of what i'm chasing you know and i've spent so many hours like editing out fret noise when my hand is moving from position and i finally realized that the bass will never sound like a piano and that's okay. when my last record i left in squeaks and attitude notes and the hand because that's what it sounds like when you play a bass Right, right. <laughs> that's the human thing of it. So, right. uh, you know, I get like everyone else. I just, I just took what uh, what came before me and stole little bits of this and little bits of that. So it's not plagiarism, not too much from right. one part. And right. uh, I just try to have my own voice, you know, and uh, pretty confident and just you know sure about what I do. And I I, I enjoy the way I play. You know, here's yeah, yeah, and your sound here's, is very gritty. You know, it's like the cor correct amount of mid lows and correct amount of this rockish vibe. You know. But yeah, my my sound. I mean, I, I found it really early. My sound sort of like here. You know, where I wanted to sound like a bass. You know, a lot of guys, boy, you know, are still stuck on that pulse jocko thing. You, you go to a bass day, and it should be called mid range day, right? And since I still come from you know playing walking bass, right. you know, I'm gonna have that. You know, uh, and so I found out really early on that I'm an, I'm an act electronic guy. I had my first EMGs put in my bass in like 1979 and 1980. Mm -hmm. And then when I first met Larry Hartke and heard those aluminum tones, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And then solid state amps, solid state amps are funny because some of them, you know, names, names were like some of the GK and some of the Trace Elliott stuff is okay. so electronic sounding, you know. And I was fortunate enough to work with Mark Bates and Cecenio to come up with, you know, an right. that state and tube. Yeah, so they're it's, amazing. So that it's clear, but it's not too um, antiseptic and electronic sounding. But I definitely want a sound that is clear, distinct, but has some yeah. bottom. That's like right, right with definition. Yeah, yeah, sure, definition. Perfect. Yeah, I like that too. I Perfect. mean, if I like, if I have to play a gig. Uh, I mean, if I'm, you know, recording whatever, but it, with a solo gig and they have an Ampeg SVT there, I will literally break my shoulder or wrist. You know, you know, you're not, to, you know, you're not supposed to do, but trying to get some kind of mid range or tone. Right. That's what happens to me every time I play that amp. Yeah. It's too boxy. Yeah. For us. <laughs> Other people sound great through it. Yeah. Some people love it. I, I don't. <laughs> I can't. I can't do it. Sorry, Ampeg. <laughs> oh god um did you have any dreams 
or goals um, in life as a kid growing up? Yeah, of course. Really? I mean, <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know, boy, I would love to have been a baseball player, of course. What? Wow. And then I, I remember it was funny because they had, uh, you know, they have Little League and then they have American Legion. And uh, when I got to, when I was about, I guess, 13, they had tryouts for the, the next level. And I made it through the first cut. And the second day, I had to choose between jazz band tryouts or baseball tryouts. And fortunately, I, I chose jazz band tryouts because I never would have been a professional baseball player. But, <laughs> That's so well, you know, I, 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 uh, wow. I, I wrote a song on, um, you know, my first record called Simple Dreams. And, uh, you know, on a good day, you know, I, I feel that uh, all I wanted to do was be a good bass player. I think I'm a good bass player. I think I've made a mark on the history of bass. I was the first person ever with a Fender signature bass, right? And uh, I'm well respected for what I do among my peers. I Absolutely. still enjoy what I'm doing and I'm getting better at it. You're the king, you know? Stu. You're the king. Uh, I, I wish I'd put in, like, you know, being rich, too, but I never really thought about that, you know? So that's really Well, hard. rich from here is all that matters. Absolutely. Ah, amazing. Good answer. I like it. <laughs> so uh, we're towards the end of our questions now. So let me pick out maybe two more and then we'll play the rapid fire. Okay, this is good. Now, everyone is trying to copy everyone and sound like someone. I guess people do that because they feel like they don't have their voice or, you know, style. Um, and they're in disbelief of themselves of how they feel there is a method to finding their voice, you know. So I wanted you to tell my listeners how they can approach towards achieving that. Uh, and there are many possibilities and everybody has their own journey, totally. But, sure, yeah, you know, everyone's yeah. for different, man. I mean, yeah. Every, I think everyone, again, like I said, you, you, you learn from everyone that's come before you. But so here's a funny thing. So, so one time someone said, who's your favorite bass player? And you know what I said? I said, me. <laughs> and you know, you know why? I'm not saying that I'm better than Jocko or better than Steve Harris or better than Chris Squire or better than Christian McBride or better than Richard Bona or better than Michael Manring. I love all those guys. But... Yeah. I like the way I play, and if I didn't like the way I played, I would probably play some other way. That <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I like my voice. Uh, it makes me happy. I, you know, I sit here and I play. That's and I get, so sweet. <laughs> I play it. So, yeah, I mean, it, but it, it, it's not, I don't think anything, you know, can happen overnight. You have to realize that you're a product of everything that came before you. And right. don't feel in a hurry, you know, you, you know, hey, man, you learn how to play, you know, Miles Davis solos, you learn how to play, you know, Mohini's lick you know, one what? day by no. day. <laughs> Trance dive, there goes drum legs and try to make no, it. Into never play. do that. And that, yeah. that, that, what that all adds, adds up to, you know, and then adding your own personality. I mean, obviously, yes, people's absolutely. personality is the way they make the bass. Are you, um, are you, so did you have to go like two different paths to become, like, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, Sometimes what happens is you are this person on stage that, um, I don't know how to put this, but there are two different journeys that sometimes one has to go through to become a musician and to become the person you are today, right? So right. were you always the same person or did you have to go through two different paths to find that one which made you have this marriage between two? Oh, man. I mean, you know, the sort of person that you are is obviously, uh, you know, a journey you go through. You know, mm -hmm. I've been sober for one month, five, one year, five months and uh, 16 days now, which is obviously, uh, you know, a good part of my journey, you know. Right. Uh, but as far as playing and, and, you know, it just takes time. You just got to be true to yourself, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. life has a lot, a lot of up and flows. And through through meditation and reading, you just have to try to, you know, calm it and, and not get too, you know, worked away by the ups and downs and live in the moment and just, you know, try to try to do the try to make the right decisions. Uh, and, and music everything. has the power to do all this. It has everything. It's, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you what, uh, you know, what pieces of music, you know, mean to me emotionally or, or the mood that I get into, you know. Right now I listen to a whole lot of like. It's called uh, 
postmodernist minimalist music, you know, like Max Richter and Arvo Part. It's really long, slow music that makes you feel beautiful. It's a guy, Max Richter, who wrote a, 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 an album called Sleep, and it's eight and a half hours long. What? And yeah, and you, you put it on when you go to sleep, and it's like two or three themes. And Please it just, send it to me. It, it, it develops so slowly, but it's like meditation, you know, conscious relaxation. The more you practice meditation, the the, the shorter time it takes your body to achieve a relaxed state. Right. When you, when you listen to music like that, it just calms your heart rate. It makes you think. It, it makes, you know, you know. I mean, I'll still wake up and put on ACDC if I'm in that kind of mood. But <laughs> in general, I like to be calm and, and focused and relaxed. Right, right, right. And it kind of helps you build uh, more of your patience as well. Patience is a wonderful thing, you know. Wonderful I mean, thing. Like you were saying with practicing, you know. I mean, yeah, when, yeah. When you, you know, when you get older, you realize that you can make progress in in weeks and months. It's not necessarily you know, you practice something. It's not like it's gonna, you know. I, when I was in college, when you're, I used to practice hours and hours a day and write. I'm gonna be the fastest bass player, but you just can't learn something in a day. Yeah. You keep, keep plugging away at it, and it then has to be you know, slow and steady. Yeah. Ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da. And then one day you'll be soloing. And all of a sudden, yeah. that becomes part of your musical Which feel, career. yeah. And then you'll be feeling it and not just playing fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Great answer. What, this is the last question, and then we'll do the rapid fire. What is the biggest challenge you have faced as a musician growing up? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because I, I, I have my foot in so many different musical worlds, and because sort of, you know, in that day when I was playing with Steve and Joe and, you know, my name is Stuart. My friends call me Stuart. You know, a lot of people know me as Stu Ham. Stu, yeah. I played, you know, Moonlight Sonata and, and Foggy Mountain Breakdown on the bass. But, um, you know, I play upright bass. I read my ass off. I swing. I'd love to see you. I've I, never seen you play the upright bass. Well, I'm not that good at it. But, you know, I'm, I'm an all-around musician. I'm not and, good. And, uh, I try. And, uh, I was uh, I was playing at a show, Muriel Anderson's All Star Guitar Night, and the the leader came up and said, "Hey, you know what? You're a good bass player, you know." <laughs> and then the opposite is that then you get you get overqualified. I can't, especially in L.A. I've been to a couple of auditions where I've been there and like something simple, like a pop gig, a blues gig, or whatever, and they go, "Man, you sound great." And then like the second day, someone will go, "Wait a minute, man, that's that guy who was in that insert with Steve Vai, and he played this stuff." And they go, "Oh, he's too good." You know, he's, he's overqualified. He wouldn't want to play. He wouldn't want to play for, you know, $20,000 a week with Madonna. I'm like, right. yes, I would. Yes, I would. So huh? it's, easy, it's easy to get typecast, you know, as a musician right. or to be overqualified for a game. Right, right, right. Sometimes people just assume things and then they would not call you. <laughs> That's a bad thing. People shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never thought being like, you know, uh, well versed and well rounded and multifaceted as a musician would hurt your career, but right. You know, I'm curious. How did you? How did you? When was the first time you heard of me? Probably. I mean, I, I'm a bass geek, man. I read all the bass magazines and stuff like that. So your name popped up. Maybe our buddy. Chris. I mean, I've known you since I was a kid because of my father. Chris, like my Chris father. Is- Chris, whose name I still can't pronounce, obviously was was talking you up for years and years and years. Uh, Who? Chris. Chris. Yes, Chris. Claire Hughes. Claire Hughes. Okay, you say it better than I do. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then I, I, I guess it was about uh, 2015, which God, it's hard to believe is is five years or so ago. But wow. you know, when when Steve re-released. Uh, Passion and Warfare right. had that extra record, and I went in the Fox, studio yeah, to record some tracks, up. and he had that crazy song with you playing on it, and yeah. I know that I'd heard of you before then, so oh. that's got to be over six years that I've, I've been aware of you, and and like mm-hmm. I said, we've had the pleasure of doing some great duo games. I know. I wish we do more like those. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, assuming someday people will get back to playing live together, I would, I would love to. I, I would... know, I would totally move there and we would just become a duo and do gigs. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man, because I'm happy to lay it down while you play all that amazing stuff you play. <laughs> I have no ego about that. I love playing bass, man. I'm, no, I'm... you're amazing. I adore you and I love you for the way you play and for the person you are. Like, you've always been my biggest inspiration, one of my biggest inspiration and will always be. Oh, you're very sweet. You're very sweet. I love you too, baby. <laughs> okay, so we're on to the rapid fire now. Okay. And uh, my first question to you is, if you could switch to any other instrument, what would it be? And it can't be any of the melodic instruments. It has to be something else. Because I know we're basically... Classical with... piano. But then again, it, it has the notes. I'm, like, it has to be a percussion instrument. Like... A percussion instrument? Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. so here's, here's, I always wondered what, what is a drummer, th and I'll preface this with my absolute best friends are drummers, Joel Taylor, John Mater, you know, I mean, they're just, they're my best friends. But if you're playing a drum solo, what do you think about, like, what am I going to hit next? How <laughs> loud am I going to hit it? And how many times am I going to hit it? <laughs> I, really, I really like melody, and I really like the way that melody works over chord changes. So you would and, not play. You would not play. Yeah, huh? so, someone said that no matter how good a drum solo is, the song can't continue until it's over. Right. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love you, Dennis. But you, know, but you know, I'm such a big fan of drums. Like, if oh, uh, yeah. I would, yeah, like you probably can guess, like, the way I play on the bass, it's so, like, yeah, yeah. Relatable. So uh, if I could, if I had to choose between bass and drums, or like if I had to survive on one, now that I, I'm like, you know, I can play the bass, I would say bass. But if I didn't play the bass, it would be drums. Oh, but it's funny. I mean, you, you, you've obviously heard like Gergo play bass. I mean, it's amazing. I'm not oh sure. My God. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's incredible I'm, not, on bass. I'm not sure it's music, but it's amazing <laughs> what he does, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a drummer and playing the bass like that, it's quite yeah, a thing. Un yeah. unbelievable. unbelievable. So, yeah. so I don't know, I mean, but but again, I haven't said that, like like Joel Taylor, you know, yeah. man, when he, he and I have played so many games before, and I had this trio with him, oh, and Alex sorry, and Blake, and we just read each other's minds. Go sorry, get the go dog. Ahead. Whoa! Holy crap, he didn't look that big when he was on the floor. He didn't look that big when he was on the floor. Yeah, she's big. She's a handful. <laughs> oh God, yeah, she's only six months. Can you believe? Ooh. Yeah. But and there's there's nothing like locking in. Like I said, when I play with Joel Taylor, he just reads my mind, and man, it's just it's it's the most wonderful thing in the world when you get a good drummer. Um, you know? I can imagine. I can only imagine. Okay, tell us something personal that the whole world don't know about you. Uh Boy, you know, I collect comic books and I've got a pretty, pretty, I've got some nice pieces of original comic book art. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that makes very me nice. Happy. That makes me that's happy. That's very nice. Um, what annoys you the most? Uh, boy, are we getting political here now? Is that what we're doing? That what we're... <laughs> no, it could be anything, like something that happens to you in everyday life or like when you're touring? Oh, I didn't know, just, I'd say just inconsiderate people, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. People people that don't bother to uh, have empathy for other people, you know, yeah. that are, like, that are driving, that are driving, stupidity. Around, that are driving around in really loud Harley Davidsons or, you know, walking into a store at, the, at this right now, not wearing a mask because they think they're right. smarter than everyone else. Just, just uh, selfish, ignorant people, I guess. You know? Right, right, true. Okay, this is the last one. <clears throat> Describe yourself in four words. Uh, inquisitive, uh, musical, um, ever searching. Is that two words or is that one? Three, and, you give three, one more. And uh, in search of Nirvana, how's that? Wow, that's a good one, good answer. Well, then not really four, but they're, you know, like. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. I like that. Amazing. So 
we're done with our interview and it was amazing yay thank hey, you the applause button. hit the applause button applause. Yeah. my mobile fell it's far away now <laughs> well i'm clapping for you always thank you so much for coming on my show thank you so much for doing this for me thank you thank you thank you thank you and when you um you know when you get ready send me all the links i'll post it and everything and absolutely be well and stay in touch don't be a stranger <laughs> you too stay in touch and we'll talk soon thank you